Good morning. Welcome to all of you as well as those over at the Woodman Heights and uh, was a stone chapel, is that as well? To all you guys watching. Uh, good to be with you. My name is Mark Gunger. I am from Green Bay, Wisconsin, the exact center of nothing. What's with all the clapping? Y'all from Wisconsin? Really? Wow. Well, that's cool. Uh, really glad to be with you. I pastor a church in Green Bay. That's a multi-site church. We have five campuses and uh, excited to come here to Colorado Springs and to share with you. I travel all over the world speaking, uh, aside from my pastoral duties, as I travel, I speak primarily on marriage. I do a whole thing about men's brains and women's brains and how they drive each other crazy. And uh, uh, so this morning I wanted to share a little bit uh, from a new book that I, I just wrote. I'm a grandfather now. We have six grandchildren. And, uh, you know, now, you know, and how many of y'all are grandparents? Is it not one of the most wonderful experiences in life? It, it truly is. It, it is God's reward for not killing your children. <laughs> and we've got six of these jelly-faced toddlers. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, we read them the books and stuff. And I love these children's books because they're these big books. They're bold and they have the big illustrations. And, the, you know, everything's written out very simply. And I thought, you know, I want to write a book like that about marriage. So I decided to do this. Now, this is not a children's book. Uh, don't, don't buy this book for your children. You'll, you'll traumatize your children. <laughs> okay, so they're at the bookstores if you want to check it out. But uh, uh, the name of the book is The Beatitudes of Marriage. Now, it's a play off of a word. Now, Jesus uh, gave on his Sermon on the Mount what we call his Beatitudes, fancy word for blessings. It's when he said, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed all this stuff like that. So there were nine of those. I said, you know, I want to do my nine Beatitudes of marriage. Now, they're not blessings. There's a play off the word beatitude. Mine are attitudes you should be. They're be attitudes. All right? So that's, that's where I'm going to go. Now, I, I realize not everybody here is uh, uh, married. Some people are single and plan to stay that way. Some people are singing, single, hoping to find someone to do life with. Others have been married and have been divorced. Some of you are happily married, and some of you are married, hoping to be single. So... <laughs> So everybody's in a different place. I get it. Okay? But these are all good principles for us. And, uh, and I want to go through these uh, Beatitudes with you this morning. Successful Beatitudes that might help you to succeed in marriage relationships. The first Beatitude is be nice. Everybody say be nice. Be nice. Just be nice for heaven's sakes. Your mama was right. If you don't have something good to say, don't say it. Now, for some bizarre reason, we think marriage license is permission not to be nice. I don't have to be nice. I'm married. All right? And some of the sweetest people in the world this morning in church, singing songs, <laughs> smiling at all the people. How y'all doing? Praise God. Hallelujah. Until we get you home. That's when the demons come out. And we think not only do we have the right to be mean as a rattlesnake, we believe it is our God-given responsibility. <laughs> but you would be wrong in thinking that. The reason we think this way is because of a line of thought that entered Western culture several decades ago. And, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with this insane line of thinking. But it goes like this. The key to a successful marriage is you have to be honest with how you feel. Be honest with your feelings. You know. And so it's got an entire generation of people today that just emotionally vomit all over each other. Because they think it's a good thing to do. After all, I have to be honest with you. Don't stop that. For heaven's sakes. My wife and I just celebrated our 41st wedding anniversary. Yes. Yes, what a lucky girl. And... Uh, People always ask us, how have you been married for 41 years? And I always say, it's because we're not honest with how we feel. <laughs> Who does that? Only crazy people do that. For heaven's sake, I'm sure there's mornings my wife wakes up, looks at me, and is convinced she's been blessed by God. 
I'm sure those mornings she wakes up, looks at me, and is convinced she married the spawn of hell. <laughs> a simple good morning will suffice. I don't need to hear everything of crazy that goes to her brain. All right? Now, without question, you'll have issues you need to discuss, and there's be times you just have to flat out fight. Hallelujah. But you can still be nice. Be civil about it. This license that we think to be mean. Some of y'all, you wouldn't be that mean to a dog. Just go off on your stuff. Because I'm married, praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Honest with how you feel. How stupid is that? If you apply that to any area of life, life would be a disaster. Can you imagine people tomorrow morning deciding to go to work based on how they feel? Calling their boss, say, listen, boss, I'd really love to come to work today. I really would. But uh, I'm not feeling it. And uh, <laughs> while I'm at it, I, I feel you're a moron. <laughs> <laughs> really? Can you imagine soldiers on the front line? The sergeant yells, charge! One soldier stands up and says, listen, sergeant, I'd love to charge. You guys know I've been very pro-charging for some time now. And, I, <laughs> and in charging rehearsals, I've been one of the better chargers. Uh, but, but I don't think it would be fair to you if I charged at this time because I'm not feeling it. They take a gun out and shoot you, for heaven's sakes. And listen to me. The key to success in any area of life is not to listen to how you feel. This idea that you've got to be connected with your feelings and your feelings help make all the decisions of your life is insanity. It's destroying our country. We need to stop. People who've been successful in life, those who've gone to college, anybody go to college? Yeah. Did you feel like studying? <laughs> you know who asked themselves if they felt like studying? The people who did not go to college. <laughs> These musicians up here this morning playing and all this stuff, you know? You know how they got this good? Because they practice mind-numbing, insane drills over and over again. That's why musicians are so odd. Because only those kind of people would do that for hours on end. This incredibly restrictive, monotonous discipline so they can get to the place of creative freedom and expression. Great musicians never ask themselves if they want to practice. Never even comes up. Nobody wants to practice. I have a nephew, Michael Gunger. He's in a band called Gunger. He's a phenomenal musician. Lots of people. I know I have friends who practice, professional musicians, six to eight hours a day. The same monotonous drills over and over and over again. But when they perform, wow, it is something to behold. Don't listen to how you feel. Don't let your kids decide on what they're going to do based on how they feel. You know what the number one reason kids don't want to do something? I don't feel like it. My kids tell me they feel like it. I just laughed. <laughs> Shut up and do it. I don't care how you feel. Good Lord. Don't go around protecting little Bobby. Well, Johnny, he doesn't, he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't feel like it. Seriously, Mom? You're going to raise a little narcissist that the rest of us have to fix later, Okay. <laughs> Just be nice. Don't listen to how you feel. Number two, be content. Everybody say, be content. be content. Just be happy. If you're the kind of person that you feel something in your life has to change before you can be happy, you'll be a victim all of your life. Don't live in the world of I'd rather be or I wish I'd rather be. Oh, if I just lived over there and I didn't live here, if I just had a nicer house than the one I've got, if I hadn't married this idiot and I would have married the other idiots... If my children weren't demon-possessed, you know, whatever. If there's something was different, I could finally be happy. No, stop. You need to be happy right now, even if your life is horrible. It's called the secret. Paul wrote about it in Philippians. Pretty familiar verse of Scripture says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We all know this verse, right? It's the most misquoted, out-of-context verse in the Bible today. People always quote it as, ah, Jesus will help me, and I'll, everything will always be great. That's not really the context. The context is I can handle anything miserable. That's the context of that verse. 
He said, whether I'm hungry, whether I'm full, whether I'm broke or I have lots, whether I'm pain or no pain at all, he says, I've learned the secret. You know what the secret is? He says, to be content no matter what my circumstances. And that's when he says, because I can do all things. The all things he's talking about is the lousy stuff of life. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Our joy has to come from God. James wrote, he says, count it all joy when your life is going terribly. It means to celebrate. It means you call up your friends and say, come on over, we're going to have a party. Really, what are we celebrating? My life sucks. <laughs> Whee! That's supposed to be our attitude. Don't matter if your life is going good all the time and circumstance. Man, you got to learn to be happy the first. And you single people, if you are miserable and you think getting married is going to make you happy... Uh, I'm sorry, that's very funny. <laughs> Look, one lonely, miserable soul that marries another lonely, miserable soul just makes a marriage of two lonely, miserable souls. Marriage isn't designed to make you happy. Good Lord. You're supposed to be happy in the first place. You need to learn to be happy even when he does the disgusting things he will do. You need to be happy even when she's buck, 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 at you all day long. You need to learn. To be happy. <laughs> Enjoy life. Enjoy the journey. Quit waiting for everything to be perfect all the time. You need to enjoy the road, because the road you're on might be a dead end. <laughs> it could be. You don't know. People say, Pastor, how will I know if I'm on a dead end? When you get to the end. <laughs> Sometimes it's, oh, man. This is the wrong way, you know. You so what? Enjoy life. That light you see at the end of the tunnel might be another train. <laughs> life is full of unexpected. You need to learn to be happy. I've never understood people who are like that. I haven't. Not, not Christian people. Because our joy should come from heaven and that we're valued. It doesn't matter what you have. You know, you need to learn to be happy. You need to learn. I remember one time we were trying to sell this house. I couldn't sell a stupid house. Thing forever sell a house. People would always come up to me and say, Pastor, you must be so upset that your house hasn't sold. And I remember looking at them thinking, really? Because I, I know that's the way they live. If they had a house that they were stuck with, and they, the life, the joy would be sucked out of their soul. Just someone stick a straw in their brain and... <laughs> maybe, oh, cry, I'm miserable, pray for me, my house. Was, Seriously? Now, I remember when we finally sold a house. Some guy came and said, how much do you want? I said, X. He says, well, I'll give you more than that. I said, that's cool. <laughs> finally sold a stupid house. And I remember people coming up to me and saying, oh, Pastor, you must be so happy now that your house is sold. And I remember looking at him thinking, man, I'd hate to live like that. I'm not happy because my house is sold. I wasn't happy because my house didn't sold. I was happy because God loves me, despite of me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Be happy. Life sometimes is great, sometimes it really is lousy. I just got back from the Khan the Film Festival, the Khan, with all the hoity toity actors and actresses and the south of France on the French Riviera. They called me, wanted me to come and tell my story about men's brains, women's brains, to this list of all these hoity toities. Sharon Stone was hosting the event and all these people, blah, blah. They paid first class business, no, first class airfare. To France, my wife and I, enjoying life. Thousand dollar a night hotels, hallelujah. And then they paid me an obscene amount of money to speak for five minutes. And when I got there, ooh, it's gonna be exciting. The guy said, Would you now please be quiet? Because it's at a dinner. Would you please be quiet as we welcome our guests who's gonna talk about such and such? I got up as soon as they started talking, they started talking louder. Totally ignored me the entire time. Three times the host got up and please ask people to be quiet. They wouldn't do it. I just talked over the top of me. It was a horrible threat. The only thing I kept thinking was, I'm buying a new boat. I'm buying a new boat. I'm buying a new boat. <laughs> and I got off and that was it. Now, if my whole goal in life was, I'm going to be famous from this one speech, I'm going to go south, I'm depressed now. See, that's what a lot of y'all do. Put everything on that one little thing. Man, sometimes that one little thing just turns out terrible. 
Now, at least I got money. <laughs> With all they paid me, all the expenses and stuff, I figured I was making $160 a second. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Crazy people. It's all right. Just enjoy life. Sometimes things work out, sometimes they don't. I got a call a couple of months ago from Hollywood. The producers of The Biggest Loser called me. You ever see the show The Biggest Loser? First thing I thought is, I'm not that fat. <laughs> they said, no, 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 we want to do a reality show around you. I was like, cool, so we're having a blast. We're enjoying the journey. We've been out to Hollywood, talked to the executives at Sony Pictures and all this stuff, and we're going to be shooting the pilot in a couple of weeks, just having a good time with it. Will anything happen with it? <laughs> Who knows? It might be picked up by a network, may not. Might be aired one time and die a quick death. <laughs> if it does, I will not be depressed. Why? Because my joy doesn't come from that stuff. You see, I'm enjoying the journey. Enjoy life, okay? You want a great marriage? Learn to be content. And by the way, you parents, I'll throw this in for free. <laughs> Quit trying to get your kids to a state of perfection before they get married. It's one of the reasons people are delaying marriage for so long. <laughs> because you're telling them, you got to wait till everything's right, all the education, all the money, wait until you're financially secure. Anybody in this room financially secure? <laughs> I'm six years old. I'm still not financially secure. And you wait for everything to be perfect, and then they get married. Of course, things will turn imperfect, and they're heading for the divorce court. Better to get married young, stupid, and broke. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Statistics prove it. The ones who get married young, stupid, and broke are the ones who build marriages that last for 75 years. You know why? Because they've learned they can be happy without anything. People say to me, what happens to you, Pastor, if you become broke? I go, it'll be great like my honeymoon. <laughs> we were so broke when we got married, we had to look up to see how the poor people lived. I told my wife, don't worry, someday we'll be poor. <laughs> Next one, be connected. Everybody say, be connected. be connected. Get some friends, you people. Good night. Nice. Oh, we have friends. I have my friends, and he has his friends. No, no, no. That's the problem. We all have crazy psycho people who think as dysfunctionally as we do. That's why they're our friends. All right? I'm not talking about your personal friends. I'm talking about couple friends. You want a successful marriage? You find some other couples, hopefully those who have better marriages than you, and you share your lives with each other. Get together, have dinner, go out, barbecue, whatever, and talk life through. Or you can spend $150 an hour at a counselor. <laughs> or comes, pick your pastor's brain to death. E -e 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 -e, help us, help us, help us, help us. Just talk it through. See, people get so crazy and they fight over the stupidest little things. Get some friends, talk it out. You'll find out they got the same problems you got. Maybe some of them figure things out. But we get so mad over stuff we can't see. You know, one guy goes, oh, I want the thermostat at 72. She said, I want it at 70. Well, I want it at 72. Your friends might say, have you tried 71? <laughs> oh, no, we never thought about that. You know. <laughs> Get some friends and don't think like this stupid American thinking that says, in marriage, it's, nobody should know our business. This is our business. Nobody should know our business, our business. That's insane thing. I wonder if some of y'all so miserable. Marriage was never designed to be two people on an island all by themselves. If it's just you and your spouse on an island all by yourselves, you will turn into cannibals and you will eat each other. <laughs> Get connected. Here's the next one. Be prepared. Everybody say, be prepared. Life is tough. Marriage is tough. It's hard. It's really, 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 really hard. But it's supposed to be. Anything worth having is hard. Look, what your spouse does may very well irritate you until the day you die. The good news is, you die. <laughs> Life is hard. That's why you want to find someone of character. You single people, you're still dating, trying to find someone to do life with, look for someone of character. Don't get caught up in how cute they are. <laughs> character will last you a lifetime. Sexy has a shelf life. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> and some of us have hit our expiration dates, man, I gotta tell you. <laughs> 
Life is hard. It's frustrating. It's unpredictable. You don't know what life's going to bring you. That's why when you get married, we make you make the big promise. Because we know what's coming. <laughs> you come to the altar, you're so excited. <laughs> it's going to be so great. It's going to be great. You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you promise <laughs> for better or for worse, richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, until you die? Because <laughs> we know what's coming. All right? You have to be prepared. Life is hard, unexpected. A couple of years ago, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was so sick, almost to the point of death. Just that first week of chemo alone. Finally, we brought her home from the hospital. They had given her too much. It was a bad reaction. She could hardly sleep at night, just off from the drugs. You know, Sunday morning, I had to get up to go get ready for church. And I looked at her, and she just said, so I wanted to be as quiet as I could, you know. Went in the bathroom, closed the door, and went to back to, you know, meditate on the John, you know, back in the back. So. <laughs> now, at the time, uh, I had a younger brother living with me because his wife had kicked him out of the house. He deserved it. <laughs> and, uh, and we're Latinos, you know, so family always lives with family. You know, that, that's why it's hard for us to fill out those job applications, you know. Nearest member not living with you. They, they, they all live with me. I, I got nobody. How do I fill this out? <laughs> so anyway, he's living with us. He lived in the basement. We call him the basement troll. And uh, he's supposed to be there six weeks. Nine months later, he's still there. And he's all depressed and getting, ah, I can't do it. I'm yelling at him. Dude, snap out of it. <laughs> Apparently yelling at depressed people is not helpful. <laughs> Who knew? So, you know, I can't deal with him. I got my wife, she's all, ah, and he's all depressed. And I'm just, ah, so I'm ignoring him and trying to help her. And somewhere during the night that night, he had just totally snapped, total manic fit. He hadn't slept for days, and he just starts hallucinating. And I'm back on the can. He comes upstairs, and he walks into the kitchen, and he gets in a big argument with me and threatens to kill me. But I'm not there. Well, my, my wife wakes up, and she hears him in the kitchen arguing with me, threatening to kill me. And, and, and she gets freaks out, so she gets 911, and she calls the police. You got to come right away. Someone's trying to kill my husband. So, okay, hang on, we're on our way. So they come. So finally, I come walking out of the john. She looks at me and goes, huh, what are you doing here? <laughs> I live here. <laughs> well, I thought you were in the kitchen. Your brother's threatening to kill me. Now, see, I think she's hallucinating. Because she's taking all the drugs, you know, la, 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 la. Well, the police were oh, for heaven's sake. So now I run outside, and the cop says, sir, is someone threatening your life? And I look at the cop, and I look at my wife, and I look at the cop. <laughs> now, you know that look your wife can give you, that I'm going to kill you look? <laughs> you should see that look when you're trying to tell a cop right in front of her that she's crazy. <laughs> this is not a good look. So I'm trying, man, she's on a lot of drugs and everything, and she's just <laughs> red in the face. I'm just... <laughs> And then all of a sudden, cop cars come zooming in front of our street. They all stop and they jump out and they surround the house with their weapons full. And I'm like, and one cop says, he just called, said he's going to blow up the building. And my wife looked at me and said, I told you. But at this point, I, I didn't care. I was like, good Lord, what do the neighbors think? It's Sunday morning, the pastor's house. <laughs> Police have surrounded it with guns. I can picture the guy across the street looking out his window going, I knew they had a crack house in there. There's <laughs> something wrong with them people over there. Just finally, they get him and get him out of there. Just Life is unexpected. It will throw stuff at you. Life is hard. You want to find someone you can do life with. When you do marriage, it's about doing life together. It's not all about giggles and grins. Next one, be proactive. Everybody say that means you got to do life on purpose. People who have good marriages have them on purpose. The rest of you are waiting for spontaneity. <laughs> Pastor, how do we get more spontaneity in my marriage? So, who cares about spontaneity? Fool your spontaneity. What you need is intentionality. Amen. <laughs> Say amen in my own sermon. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Jesus taught us that you reap what you sow. The Bible's very clear. It says, 
you, God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. You say, well, he'll forgive me? Sure. But you're still going to reap what you sow. It's, it's the realities of life, okay? If your life stinks, it's because you're doing stinking things. Now, we don't like to hear that because we, we live in an America today where my life is bad because of everybody else's fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's my parents' fault. It's the government's fault. Everybody else's fault. So it's not my fault. In my life, it's terrible. It's a mystery. The truth of the matter is if your life stinks, you're doing stinking things. Now, if you don't know what those are or are having a difficult time defining them, come see us. That's why the church is here. We've got pastors and people here that will minister to you and help you identify the stinking things you're doing. But you're going to have to be proactive. You get good life on purpose. Here's the next one. Be clear. Everybody say be clear. Be clear. Now, this is an important one because usually in a marriage, you have one very emotive person and the other one is much more not emotive. Usually it's the wife, but not always. There are lots of marriages where it is the guy. He's all feely, touchy, emotive. Now, the problem with emotive people is they think they're being clear because they feel it so deeply. And they're convinced everyone can tell how I feel. And when you don't feel it, they think you're an insensitive, cold monster. But it's not. It's just you've got to be clearer. Habla inglés. All right? You've got to speak English. Be very clear about what you need and what you're feeling and what you're going through. Don't just expect someone else is going to get it. Okay? Now. Most of the time, it's women who tend to feel this way. It's just a stereotype, but it's just a stereotype. Now, the reason you have stereotypes is because generally it's true. But it's not always true. There's always exceptions to stereotypes. We don't have a cow. For example, a typical stereotype. Men are more interested in sex than their wives. Why would you say that? Because it's generally true. But it's not always true. There's lots of relationships where it is the wife who is much more interested in sex than her husband. In fact, if you're listening to me right now and you happen to be in a relationship where your wife is much more interested in sex than you, I think I speak for all the men this morning when I say that we hate you. <laughs> Please do not share. Uh, but it's just a stereotype, okay? So stereotypically, women are more emotive than men. And they think they're being clear when they're not. So let me throw this little free thing for you this morning. How, ladies, this alone is worth a hassle of coming to church today. I'm going to share with you how you can get a man to do what you want him to do. All right? Important stuff. You might want to write this down. All right? Number one, ask for what you want. Be clear. Well, if he really loved me, he'd know what I want. It's Colorado. I had to throw that in. All right? <laughs> they want to relate to your culture. You know what I'm saying? Quit smoking the dope, for heaven's sakes. If you think he's going to know just because he loves you, you're crazy. If you want him to know what you're feeling and thinking, you have to say, you want something from a man, ask for it. Number two, you need to ask more than once. <laughs> Asking a man to do something once is like never having asked him to do it at all. <laughs> say, why is that? Why is that? Why? Because we don't want to do it. Is that such a mystery? You know, here's a clue, ladies. If we wanted to do it, we'd have done it already. We don't want it. What do you care what he wants? Just you ask, you ask again. Number three, you need to ask without insulting. What's the matter with you? Can't you pick up the laundry? No, I can't. I, was... <laughs> I wish I could. I just can't do it. I just... <laughs> of course, now we have very spiritual women. Are spiritual, very spiritual. So no, no, no. My husband was more godly. More like God. Godly. We wouldn't have that problem. Because that's unbiblical. It's very unbiblical. 
Really, you want your husband to be more godly, like God? Oh, let's talk about that for a minute. Forget about your stupid husband. <laughs> let's talk about you and God. Now, if you want something from God, what's the first thing you have to do? You have to ask for what you want. Even though God, unlike your husband, actually knows what you want <laughs> before you ask him. But Jesus taught, if you don't ask him, you ain't getting jack squat. <laughs> Number two, Jesus taught, you need to ask more than... That proves God's a man right there. <laughs> all right, it's a joke. Just relax, all right? Just, just lighten up, lighten up. He said you need to ask, keep on asking, knock, keep on knocking, be persistent. And number three, you don't insult God when he doesn't move according to your timetable. Hey! <laughs> See, apparently your husband is more godly than you thought. Next one is Be Doers. Everyone say, Be Doers. Get the book because I'm running out of time. You have to read about that, all right? You got to do the right thing. Just thinking and feeling the right thing doesn't mean jack. You might believe all the right stuff, but if you don't do it, it's not going to help you. Next one, Be Patient. Everybody say, Be Patient. Be patient. The good news, ladies, is you can get a man eventually to where you want him. See, women do improve men, and they do change. Men don't like being improved. Men don't like being changed, but every study has shown that married men fare much better than single men. Same education, same everything. You take a married man, married men are happier, they are healthier, they live longer, they make more money, are more productive than single men. In fact, studies show that being single is one of the most dangerous things a man can do in our culture. They say it's the equivalent of smoking two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. Isn't that amazing? I guess the worst thing is a single guy who smokes two and a half pig <laughs> six cigarettes a day. So women do improve men. You can eventually get a man to where you want him. Girls, the bad news is then he dies. Because it took so long, you know. Got to be patient. Marriage is a dance that is perfected over time. You ever go to a wedding and they have the slow dancing, and all the young people do the slow dancing, and they grab each other and waddle back and forth like penguins. You know, just, <laughs> they're just terrible. They don't know what to do. They're just, uh... But the older couples, do you watch the older couples? As they float around the room, and they twirl, and they spin, because they've learned how to interact with each other. Marriage is a dance that is perfected over time. You have to be patient. Finally, be dead. Everybody says, be dead. What is that about? Listen, you can't possibly read the New Testament without coming away with the idea that God wants to kill you. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Not the physical you, but the selfish part of you. How many times the New Testament talks about laying down your life Picking up your cross. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. In other words, that it gets down in there and it transforms. It stops being what it was. If it doesn't die, it'll just remain a seed stuck in the ground. But if it will die and transform, it will break out of the dirt into the glorious sunshine. But boy, if that doesn't describe a lot of people today, married, single, Christian, non-Christian, they get planted in the ground and they refuse to let go. And they come for counseling. Pastor, it's so dark in here and I'm cold and I can't move and <laughs> there's dirt in my mouth all the time. <laughs> what do I do, Pastor? What do I do? Die already for the love of God. Let go and let God, because if you will let go, you will have new life bust out of you and you will break into the glorious sunshine of his grace. But you got to let go, which brings us to the final point about marriage. Nobody gets everything they want. In fact, God doesn't even want you to get everything you want. At some point, you need to let go and let God.
Do you know why God wants us to die? Because dead people are very easy to get along with. <laughs> very patient dead people. You could ignore them all day, they don't care. Poke them with a stick, they never hit you back. They're very nice people. You need to let go. Well, Pastor, how do I get such a such? In fact, most of the questions, if I were to take questions from all the campuses, you could email them, text them to me. Most of the questions would be, how do I get my spouse to do? And fill in the blank. That's what most of you are thinking this morning. How can I, how can I get this? You don't get everything you want. In fact, you're not even supposed to have everything you want. God wants you to die to yourself. And there is no more perfectly crafted institution designed to kill you than marriage. Because you can't do it and stay selfish. It's impossible. And all marriages end for one reason and one reason only. Somebody or both of them gets selfish. We need to learn to let go and to let God. Because Jesus said if you hang on to everything you want, you won't get anything. But if you'll let go, you'll start to receive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that you love us and care for us. I thank you for all these wonderful people listening this morning. So many different stages of life. But Lord, one thing is true. If you want to save your life, you said, you're going to have to willingly lose it. For people this morning, maybe that are here and they've never truly become a Christ follower, just kind of checking things out. Pray that you would open their eyes and let them see that they need to let go if they're going to experience God. Because one of the greatest fears before people come to Christ is, what am I going to lose? What am I going to lose? What am I going to lose? But you need to be able to let go and let God. Because when you let go, that's when life will burst out of you. And you start enjoying the wonderful, glorious sunshine that he wants for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Have a fabulous day. Thank you.